The Amazon Prime series The Boys was a breakout hit that seemingly came out of nowhere. Going into it, I had never heard of the comic series before, so I had no idea what to expect. What is this, a parody of DC I once thought? Who is this knockoff Superman, Batman, and Wonder Woman? I was skeptical to say the least, but upon watching it for the first time, I was hooked. I absolutely loved it. So when I heard there was a season 3 coming out, I was ecstatic, but I was also impatient. How on earth could I potentially fill this gap that only boys, wait I should rephrase that sentence, how on earth could I potentially fill this gap that only this incredible series could fill, I once thought. Then it clicked. The comic. I binge read the entirety of the Invincible comic run right after the first season concluded, so why not do the same for the boys? So to Amazon I went, and a few days later I had the first three omnibuses, um, omnibi. I had the first three big volumes of the boys comic series. I sat down, turned on some lo-fi music, had a nice hot cup of coffee, and started reading. And I was thoroughly disappointed. When reading the comics, right off the bat, you are hit with some immediate differences. The world of the boys is vastly different from what we see in the show. For starters, within the first couple of issues, the boys are dosed with temporary compound V, which makes them much stronger and far more resilient when fighting soups. In contrast to the show, where they only receive temporary V in season 3, which also randomizes a set of powers for anyone who takes it. Huey is also Scottish and, well, Simon Pegg. The Seven is slightly different with the character of Translucent never appearing in the comics. Instead, it was Jack from Jupiter, a Martian Manhunter knockoff. In the comics, Starlight's introduction to the Seven was far more f***ed up. Madeline Stilwell and Victoria Newman were James Stilwell and Victor Newman. Comics Newman, by the way, didn't have any powers and was just a Bush parody. Stormfront also saw a gender change and had a much more integral role in the show than they did in the comics. Homelander's son Ryan killed Becca when he was born, which resulted in Butcher killing him as a baby. However, his conception was still the same and Becca didn't disappear afterwards as she did in the show. Soldier Boy was a nothing character who slept with Homelander and then got his nose bit off and then was subsequently killed by Butcher. Also, there were three individuals to hold the mantle of Soldier Boy, all of which were extremely underpowered and extremely pathetic compared to the show's interpretation. Kimiko is simply referred to as the female, and to my knowledge, Kimiko was a name only created for the show. Her origins in the show being the result of Vought's attempt to create supervillains was completely different in the comics. When she was a baby, she accidentally ate experimental compound V and was held prisoner under study for most of her life. While we currently don't know the origins of Mother's Milk's name in the show, in the comics, it's because he's a soup and was dosed with a bad strain of compound V as a baby. This resulted in him having great strength. However, if he didn't drink his, uh, mother's milk, he would shrivel up and die. Y yeah, I, I think Homelander's got that weird milk thing covered for the show. Anyway, arguably the biggest difference was the Transoceanic Flight 37 incident in Season 1. In the comics, it wasn't just some random plane that was hijacked. It was one of the planes from 9-11. The Seven botched the rescue attempt so bad that the plane missed the Twin Towers and hit the Brooklyn Bridge. Now, these aren't all of the differences, rather a handful that aren't necessarily massive spoilers. These changes are to be expected too. Translucent replacing Jack from Jupiter makes total sense because that would require a lot of makeup. Also, when the show first began, no one knew if it would be a success or not. So they more than likely didn't have a budget as high as they do now. So we might potentially see him later. Who knows? The Transoceanic Flight 37 just being a random plane also makes sense because if it was one of the planes from 9-11, it would just open up a whole can of worms that the showrunners definitely didn't want to deal with. Soldier Boy being beefed up and the prototype Homelander makes way more sense for a character who in the comics is supposedly the second most popular soup next to Homelander. All these little changes make total sense translation wise, which is extremely rare when it comes to the act of translating a comic or books to the big screen, because typically something gets lost in translation. When it comes to adapting a book, the source material is most likely better for a variety of reasons. For starters, written work typically contains far greater detail in comparison to adaptations. You also get a better understanding of who the main character is and how they will think. And most importantly, movies and shows based on books are simply interpretations of the source material and are often altered to appease a broader audience. Because of all of that, books are often better the vast majority of the time. However, things start to change when adapting a comic or graphic novel. There hasn't been one singular comic book movie that is a one-for-one -one with its source material. More often than not, comic book movies are an amalgamation of multiple storylines combined to create a somewhat new and somewhat unique retelling of a story. This has worked time and time again for DC and Marvel, well, 
Marvel more so, but you get my point. Another reason why comics can't be translated one for one is because comics, narratively speaking, are much faster. There could be an entire arc wrapped up in about four issues totaling maybe 30 or so pages. In terms of translation, that's not a lot to work with. And when adapting that for a show, the episodes are typically an hour long, so that's a lot of extra legwork the showrunners have to do in terms of fleshing out a story. Because of that, comics aren't necessarily harder to translate, it's just different. It may be far easier to visually translate a comic, but turning an arc into a whole movie or show is a far more daunting task. That's why shows and movies will often break up multiple arcs and mix and match the pieces. Just look at Invincible, for example. A lot of episodes from season one aren't chronologically accurate as they appear in the comic. For instance, Omni-Man didn't kill the Guardians until issue eight, and the Invincible Omni-Man showdown wasn't until issue 12, which in comparison was the first and last episode of season one. What I'm very convolutedly trying to say is that translating written work can be a daunting task, with many many external factors that greatly affect the final product. And what's crazy is The Boys doesn't follow the comics all that much, and it's much better because of it. An important factor to note when discussing The Boys comic is the idea behind its conception. The creator of The Boys, Garth Ennis, didn't hide the fact that he doesn't like superheroes. He's gone on record as saying that the superhero genre makes no sense and is ridiculous and silly. In fact, he has a general disdain for the genre as a whole. Not only that, but at the time, and really still now, superhero comics were all the rage. If he wanted to get something published, he had to write about superheroes. That's where the boys came from. The series was made out of disdain for the genre, and it's greatly reflected in its portrayal of the characters. All the characters in the comics, soups or otherwise, are just gross. There's really no better way of describing them. There are next to no redeeming factors about any of the soups besides Starlight, who really is the only good one. They're all unbelievably fucked up. Essentially, if you wear a cape in the comics, then you are irredeemable. Everything about the comics comes off as mean-spirited towards the genre. Not only that, but the characters are just one-dimensional. Now, I'll be perfectly clear here, I haven't finished the entire run yet, but from what I've read, all the soups are all just the same character. All soups are weird sexual deviants, all soups murder humans without a second thought, and all soups take shitloads of drugs and drink like a fish. The only two soups that are truly unique and dynamic are Starlight and Homelander, kinda. And I say kinda because from what I've read, he's just kind of there. In fact, the seven are barely in the first three omnibi- um, omnibuses. God, God, God damn it, I'm just gonna go with omnibuses. The seven are barely in the first three omnibuses, and when they are there, they're just kind of nothing. Homelander included. I've read online that Homelander does eventually become more in line with his show counterpart nearing the end of the series, but I haven't gotten there yet. It was kind of teased in Herogasm, but that's about it. But the boys themselves feel hollow as well. Butcher is an asshole, but not as much as he is in the show, which is weird. And in the show, you get a pretty good idea as to why he acts the way he does. MM is just kind of a muscle character and that's about it. Nothing about him being the heart of the group or having OCD because Soldier Boy killed his family. Frenchie is just crazy in the comics, like that's it. There's nothing about his checkered past or his abusive father. He's just crazy. Kimiko is just another muscle character that rips people's faces off occasionally. That's it. No conflicting morals about being a weapon, no brother, no sign language, and a barely noticeable relationship with Frenchie. And Huey was just a dude from Scotland who lost his girlfriend when A-Train threw a villain through her. Butcher eventually finds him and then recruits him and then boom, he's on the boys. Sure, he has his doubts in the comics about doing what he does, but there's no inferiority complex, no tech skills, no awkwardness, and no charm really. He's just the stereotypical Scottish dude. However, in the show, Huey has all those aforementioned features, and because of that, you get a far more dynamic and likable character. But I think my biggest gripe with the comics is the incessant use of temporary V. As I said before, all the boys dose themselves with the temporary compound V before every fight, and that's it. And they don't care that they do it. The way they react in the show is how I'd imagine they should react if one of them took it. Just look at episode five of season three. The whole point of what we do, the whole goddamn point is that no one should have that kind of power. The whole point of the story is that soups are bad. So when humans who have no powers are actually winning against literal gods, it makes for a vastly more satisfying plot. In fact, every plotline in the show is vastly more satisfying. The origins of Compound V, Stormfront's backstory, Huey and Starlight's relationship, Starlight's story in general, Homelander's descent into madness, A-Train's conflicting morals, The Deep being a f***ing loser, Butcher and Ryan's relationship. Hell, I'd even argue Herogasm was better in the show. 
In contrast to that, in the comics there's a whole arc where Huey gets his red wings unknowingly and gets made fun of by the boys, because they can see it. And then he is conflicted about if his relationship with Starlight is over because of it. Yeah, the show does a way better job at dealing with plotlines. The main difference I see in the comic versus the show is this. The comics thrive on shock value and hate the superhero genre, and it never lets you forget it. Whereas the show thrives on character drama and is more of a parody of real life made with love for the genre as a whole. Despite the show's negative portrayal of superheroes, you can still tell there's a deep love for the genre. Not only that, it genuinely feels real. If a TikTok, Instagram, or shitty YouTube influencer suddenly gained godlike powers, I'd imagine they'd act exactly as they do in the show, but not as they do in the comics. And that's the biggest thing, the show feels closer to reality than the hyper-violent and hyper-sexualized version seen in the comics. Maybe it was meant to be stylized, who knows. In my eyes, it definitely works better when sticking to reality rather than straying away. Regardless, the show is simply phenomenal. Characters, story, everything. I don't know if I'll ever finish the comics. I'm really 50-50 on whether or not I should. My OCD says I should complete the collection, but my brain doesn't know if it wants to read through another weird orgy scene or watch someone shove a hamster up their ass.